All right, welcome back to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. My name is Christine, and I'm here with Rob and John. Hello. Hey there. And this week, we are discussing a story that Rob picked. Rob, why don't you introduce the story and tell us what part you'll be reading? This is Alice Munro's Voices, and you can find it. If you just do a quick Google search of, I don't know, free Alice Munro stories, you're going to come across it. Uh, it's from 2013, and I'm going to read probably the first, we'll say three or four, first three or four paragraphs. When my mother was growing up, she and her whole family would go to dances. These would be held in the schoolhouse, or sometimes in a farmhouse with a big enough front room. Young and old would be in attendance. Someone would play the piano, the household piano or the one in the school, and someone would have brought a violin. The square dancing had complicated patterns or steps, which a person known for a special facility would call out at the top of his voice, who was always a man, and in a strange, desperate sort of haste, which was no use at all unless you knew the dance already, as everybody did, having learned them by the time they were 10 or 12 years old. Married now, with three of us children, my mother was still of an age and temperament to enjoy such dances if she had lived in the true countryside where they were still going on. She would have enjoyed, too, the round dancing performed by couples, which was supplanting the old style to a certain extent. But she was in an odd situation. We were. Our family was out of town, but not really in the country. My father, who was much better liked than my mother, was a man who believed in taking whatever you were dealt, not so much my mother. She had risen from her farm girl's life to become a school teacher, but this was not enough. It had not given her the position she would have liked, or the friends she would have liked to have in town. She was living in the wrong place and had not enough money, but she was not equipped anyway. She could play euchre but not bridge. She was affronted by the sight of a woman smoking. I think people found her pushy and overly grammatical. She said things like readily, and indeed so. She sounded as if she had grown up in some strange family who always talked that way, and she hadn't. They didn't. Out on their farms, my aunts and uncles talked the way everybody else did, and they didn't like my mother very much either. I don't mean that she spent all her time wishing that things weren't as they were, like any other woman with wash tubs to haul into the kitchen and no running water and a need to spend most of her summer preparing food to be eaten in the winter. She was always kept busy. She couldn't even devote as much time as she otherwise would have done in being disappointed with me, wondering why I was not bringing the right kind of friends, or any friends at all, home from the town school, or why I was shying away from Sunday school recitations, something I used to make a grab at, and why I came home with ringlets torn out of my hair, a desecration I had managed even before I got to school, because nobody else wore their hair the way she fixed mine. Or indeed why I'd learned to blank out even the prodigious memory I once had for reciting poetry, refusing to use it ever again for showing off. I love that line. Uh, People found her pushy and overly grammatical. Yeah, it's a great description. Uh, I chose this. uh, If you you guys haven't heard of Alice Munro yet, you're really in for just a huge treat. She has this kind of ineffable combination of folksy folksy elegance that maybe I would describe it is it's kind of um it really sneaks up on you you think you're getting just not a run of the mill story but you feel like you know these people but you never really do it there's no face value here she's so insightful and kind of, there's a chilliness to her too as well that I really like she's a Canadian writer so I don't know if that's just the weather but <laughs> hey. but she's she's sentimental but not overly sentimental uh, I think this story is probably a pretty good indication of that yeah, to kind of wrap up the story for you the the young girl goes to a dance and we find out there's a prostitute there and she walks by the prostitute and meanwhile the daughter's really disdainful of her mother as we already know the mother is, is extremely pretentious and to see this kind of counterbalance between this overly grammatical mother and then these pro- and then what we can assume are maybe two prostitutes um was really just a weird kind of very realistic slice of life that, that I doubt any of us have ever encountered it's interesting too i didn't really put this together until now that um the story we last discussed uh the david Sedaris piece and this one are both forms of memoir um cuz i think there's an introduction on this one website that kind of talks about how Alice Munro is not one to write about her life but these are this is one of like four or five of these kind of vignettes where she she did that and so to your point like this is a weird you know situation but it's also one that apparently like rose to the top for her it was like a defining moment somehow or at least like defining in her relationship for her mother yeah i I, I haven't read her stuff but um like you said overall like this piece was surprising yeah it really is you think it, you're kind of getting a story from from your grandmother or something, at first, but once you start getting into some of the metaphors, the metaphors are really subtle and they kind of sneak up on you again. Uh, the staircase, the staircase that the little girl runs up and she kind of runs into who I assume is a younger prostitute. Maybe it comes from it meets. It starts in two different rooms and then ends up in the same place. So it starts in the kitchen, which maybe we could think of 
as being that's where the the working class would hang out, but then it starts in the front room, but they kind of meet in this point. And where do they meet? They meet where a prostitute is, which is really interesting. And kind of the one that I found even more effective was there's kind of, aside from the shame that's already built in where we're seeing a prostitute for the first time, but the people are pretty, whosoever house it is, the person's apt to pull the blinds over the windows. And this being World War II, and we're guessing it's two years in, so it's what, 41, 42, if we're counting on when the war started in Europe. Then you can imagine that people were blacking out the windows on the other side of the pond, but for very different reason. And so I was kind of thinking that in one instance, yeah, we're close, we're shutting the blinds because there's a dance, there's prostitutes here, but it's also like, they're almost ashamed to be having fun given what's going on at the time. Oh yeah. That was like the context, like going into it, right? That her family maybe wasn't going to be invited to this kind of thing in general, but also to be invited at this time was just like this other, well, for the, for the writer, for Alice, it, it all lended itself to this being like, like this coveted social event. You had to be there and oh my God, they were going. Yeah, you got the idea that this was the only social event. And then she, and because of it, she's forcing herself to like overlook all of these problems she's got with her mom. Mm. She's like, okay, fine. Like do my hair like that. Like I'll wear this. And yeah. And the mom's overlooking the fact that they're going at all. I mean, you would. Yeah. You know. Well, um, the first thing I noticed was like how long some of these sentences are. And they're not run-ons, but she does a really good job of like the long sentences, the long paragraphs, super, super, super like in the weeds descriptive. But then she'll break it up with like a short couple sentences and a short paragraph. I don't know. I think that's nice for the eye when you're looking at stories like this. And then to use like your description, Rob, of the last story that we talked about, like adding levity or like letting the air out. That's what it feels like. Like even if you were to read this out loud, it's run on, run on, run on, run on, run on. And then punch, punch, punch. And then like you get to like sit with the thought for a second with like that paragraph break. So I really liked um, the pace of it that way. But um, I think you also mentioned too like something about like the descriptions. I think this is like something that like newer writers maybe don't understand is that she's giving us a ton of description, like a ton of description. But it's because we don't know anything about this. She has to like lay it all out there for everything to make sense. For it to make sense like in, in the context of this city and town, in the context of her relationship with her mother who we don't know in the context of the war. So we have to get all of that for it to land. But also everything that she's saying is unique. It's not like uh, the prostitute was wearing a white dress and it was weird. She's like, and, and it fell on her body like lard or something. Like the descriptions are like, you can't mimic them. You wouldn't think to describe things that way. You've never seen anything like it. So the fact that she's going into detail is not, it's not boring. It's not like over overdone or anything. It's like completely necessary. Like there was no description here that I was reading and thinking like, I didn't get anything out of that. You know, when uh, someone will describe like a setting and they're like, and there were red rose petals. Well, unless it's like a massive metaphor like what is that added for me and here everything felt like it was lending itself to like class or the time so as i was reading this i wrote on the margin like why is the summary so compelling right it's like like you said it's basically an info dump and we're told yeah. don't do an info dump because that's boring but why is this so not boring right and i think and i kind of hinted at this in the last our last episode is i think that the details themselves are m minor stories or at least hint at minor stories like like you said it's it's about class it's about their background it's about where they everything that is being described tells a story about where they are um, what's going on in the world around them, the relationship between mother and daughter, all kinds of things are like these tiny little glimpses at stories. And I think that's what makes it so interesting is you're seeing that. Yeah, it's like an info dump, but it's all the details are telling. They're not just like, let me describe this before I launch into it. It's like, I'm launching into it right now, but I'm, but you have to catch up and this is how you're going to catch up. Yeah. She really does have a sense of speed to herself, which yeah. is kind of a good trick when the sentences are long because sometimes if, that can make it feel slow. Oh yeah. It's like your brain is catching up and the, the words are like tumbling out. Some of the descriptions even seemed like they were uh, self-referential -self -ref in a way. When she's describing, um, she's describing the, the older prostitute as both old and polished, bold as brass, and yet mightily dignified. That really seemed to kind of reference back to her, even her own writing style, where it's extremely polished. And you could say she's really... She's applying these words with a scalpel sometimes, it seemed like. But they're really big, too. And there's kind of a genderless quality to it that I like a lot, too. It's just, she's super arty to me. I've read, I don't know, 
maybe a dozen of her stories and they're so artistic. The, the, the descriptions just go on and on. And that's as John and Christine are saying, that's where the characters are. And that's kind of where the plot is. It's, it's in the life that's around her. And I kind of wonder if growing up in the natural world and growing up surrounded by the natural world in the early 20th century, if that's just, that's just kind of how it is. Like you're going to, your introduction to reality isn't through whether technology or through contemporary relationships, but it starts first at what's around you. And maybe she, maybe you just being in this generation, you just have a better ability to see and then make connections from what you do see. So that'd be a, a, a good thing for us to take away, I think. Rob's jumping to the end of the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, you, you meant, uh, Rob, you mentioned pace and just made me think about uh, it's all one scene, basically. But throughout that scene, we're reaching back into, you know, larger issues about economics, the uh, class, like you said, Christine, and um, et cetera. But we don't get to that scene really for a while for at least a few paragraphs it starts like okay we're going to a dance and we arrive at the dance but we keep reaching back and i think that that could also be part of the way in which she's presenting it as a story is um setting up that expectation in the reader of like okay the thing's gonna we're getting to a a place where something's gonna happen and like the more i reach back for the necessary details like you talked about like everything is necessary there's a lot that we need to know in order to really get what's going to happen is um she's also pulling us into what's going to happen Mm -hmm. right so i think that those two things working in tandem are what really makes it yeah. fly. She's she's characterizing people, but only in the sense that we need to know like what the stakes are and what the expectations are. Like she's she's not telling us about like where her mom grew up or like what her maiden name was because those are unnecessary details. But the necessary details are that she's a certain way. She's uppity, and so when she sees this whore on the street on the, on the staircase, she's gonna have a reaction, and like we can guess that with what we do know about her. She's giving us all the tools that we need to have the proper reaction. And then the mom is kind of that perfect judgmental thing that you know that's implanted in there. And is you're kind of wondering, well, is the girl going to swing to her mom's side or is she going to grow up right there in front of us? And I don't, I don't think it's, you never get like a straight answer, which is pretty satisfying. Yeah. Um, maybe let's talk about the ending then. Cause um, that wasn't, I love where it went and where it ended up and like where we were with her, the daughter, like confronting this, who we think is like the second prostitute. Um, but the takeaway was surprising for me. I thought the takeaway was going to be very much about like the context of that party, but the takeaway was kind of like about how this memory of these men being kind to this woman is one that stuck with her like long after the memory of the men faded, like the memory of, of a man being kind to, to a woman in general, not necessarily even like a woman of a, of a certain class or rank or that gave me a lot to think think about which like i don't want to sound like pompous but like i don't often like sit there and like dwell on endings but i was like wow there's like a lot to unpack here that is simple enough for me to understand but i think the fact that it was like a kind of a twist ending a surprise ending for me like is what makes me keep thinking about it she obviously this is a memory for her that if it's all true like like we're made to believe it's the ending that is really powerful right like this is why she keeps thinking of the party is because of what she took away from it it wasn't just this like crazy party it was also like and because of that party i had this lesson that i thought about over and over and over and over and over for years and years and years and for it to be in the context of kind of just a worldwide calamity too gives it such gives it a strange edge that i we can't relate to which i think is is part of the attraction of it is none of this arguably this, that that scene doesn't happen unless there's a war on and these british guys are over the british airmen are over visiting and they're and they're talking to this young girl and i'm kind of personally just fascinated in how um the civilian life changed during that time and to kind of see it here and to to see it in in Canada no less, which I'm I'm assuming was even that much more different than the U.S. is now, you know, just by virtue of globalization or whatever. But then for but but then just to take away kind of the hum the the more personal element where this girl is just she's feeling competitive with the young prostitute and judgmental kind of in her own way, not in her mom's way, but just like, you're just like a whiny girl and that's all there is to young adulthood. And then she's kind of feeling like this pre-sexual attraction to the guys that she's not even aware yet. So that was, that was absolutely satisfying because, because you're not, because like Christine said, you're not expecting it. You're expecting it to wrap it up for you. And that's kind of a, not to use the same word as I used last time, but that's kind of a lazy way to wrap endings up is just like, well now like serve your reader something else, surprise yourself as a writer and, Maybe that's what she had done. Yeah, like the ending, um, it leaves the scene. It leaves the time of the story. Like it, it takes us through this other thought 
that leaves the page and leaves the, the setting mm-hmm. and the time and all that. I think there's like, like you said, war lends something. It's almost like, like this is real, so it's all within context. That's why it's interesting. But war just lends a different quality to any plot. And um, I, this reminded me too of um, one of the five books that I've read, which is um, Atonement. So if you haven't read it, it's about like this young girl seeing some kind of encounter between her sister and a soldier. And it was some kind of like a sexual encounter, but she doesn't understand it. And her interpretation of it and what she does with it ends up ruining the relationship, but also like kind of their lives. And the book is told in a way that shows you how it all unfolds. And then at the end, it's kind of this like cruel twist ending where, oh, but that was all made up. Um, actually, the soldier died in war. And this is my imagined future for them. This is what I wish would have happened. It's one of those like kind of like shit endings that they tell you not to like have the character wake up from a dream, but it works because it's so well done. Anyway, it's a spoiler, but it's it's all like it's, it's <laughs> yeah. all changed by the context of war. This this story about what this little girl did matters tenfold in in a time when men are dying. I think there's also you mentioned how the ending moves away from that scene and like yeah. travels through time. There's a tension in the story, the, in the telling of the story between the point of view of uh, the ten year old version of the narrator and the older version of the narrator looking back on it, where she's const- um, constantly but back and forth kind of. Um, what did my 10 year old self see what do I understand it to be now so that when we get to that ending it kind of like bridges those two I think that that also helps make it work right and that was the other thing I I was mostly wanting to talk about for this one because especially after reading the David Sedaris speech so we've talked about memoir and how he's been criticized for embellishing things which is inevitable in memoir but especially in his which is so dialogue heavy and so like humor driven so but for this piece I think a newer writer might try to wrestle with themselves about what actually happened and to get like the truth on the page. And what Alice Monroe here is doing is letting the reader watch her struggle through what she does recall and why she recalls this and whether she would have recalled that or whether this could have happened. She's even like trying to guess her, her relative age to the war. She, she's And she's not serving it up as truth because by that ending, which moves away from the plot, what we realize is that the details don't matter for this. And in memoir, even if it's truth, the, what matters is what what ends up at the bottom like when you sift it all out you know like what is what's the core feeling here and she arrives at that even without all of the details and she arrives at that having struggled to recall them like the memory is is made having recalled it over and over and over I think that's like so important to think about when you're when you are trying to write about something that actually happened. And the fact that you're trying to recall it is an exercise in and of itself and is important to the story. Yeah, it's dramatic. Like why are you telling us this? She's like I'm trying to remember why I'm trying to tell you this. Like why this is so important to me. Which is intriguing and by its own. I want to watch that. Yeah, because we don't know at the beginning, you know, what happens like we've pointed out. But the fact that she's like struggling with it is is makes it that much more interesting. It reminds me of the story that I think was our first episode which John picked. It was like the we didn't know if the narrator was male or female. I was I wrote the name of that down. I was going to mention it afterwards because that's their unreleased first episode with their original first God co-host, damn it. <laughs> Greg Stanley. Yeah. Rest in peace. <laughs> that was um, Maiden Kane. Okay, which I feel like we ought to do again at some point. Just use but, it as uh, a bonus episode, man. Yeah, maybe. If I say it on air, you have to. <laughs> I can cut that out. <laughs> yeah. Well, in that story, I won't summarize it, but the narrator is also, and whether or not that's an actual true story, I can't remember, but the narrator also struggles with the truth and then confronts another character in the story who remembers the story completely differently. And they have this kind of like confrontation about it. They're like, that's not what happened. And it's like, are you kidding me? This has defined my life. It begins nowadays, the memory goes like this. Right. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. So I, I that starts, was what I was interested like in this. here. It seems like an expert writer that's willing to struggle on the page that way yeah and take her time too which i think maybe we as contemporary writers are i gotta get the conf so i mean for so many published writers were everyone's got the mfa everyone's well trained everyone's a well-oiled machine you gotta get this gotta click this and you can kind of see the gears in motion sometimes when you read things and that's so unsatisfying but then it's on the other on the other hand it's fun just to kind of go back in time with someone who is still alive i think i think Alice Monroe, I think she retired within the last five years, um, but she retired at the almost the age of 85, 86. Nice. So this stuff's really valuable, and especially as the generation's moving on. So One of the moments where that happens is she writes, uh, I think that if I was writing fiction instead of remembering something that happened, I would never have given her that dress, mm-hmm. a kind yes. of advertisement she didn't need, which is... It's so meta. Yeah. And it works really well because it helps build the character. 
the narrator, that distinction between memory and um, current uh, reflection. Right. And it doesn't it doesn't read performatively either. No. It doesn't sound like someone who's on a stage for you, which I get from a lot of reading too. Yeah, it's not like this um, tongue-in-cheek aside or something. No, it's more like... It's um, guileless. There's really no irony. Yeah, or it's almost like how you would tell an actual story. Like, oh, I was, dry- I was at the grocery store and there was this guy with this shirt, but you never come back to the guy with the shirt, you know? And your readers, your listeners kind of like, well, what about that? And she's kind of pointing out like, well, this is it. This is how I remember it. And for what it's worth, it's important, but it's also like kind of a red herring. And that just really produces a main line to the reader. That seems to really up the in- intimacy factor for me when we can watch this person do that without her kind of peeking out the margin and say, you're still watching me? Do you like this part? What about this joke? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, what else do we want to talk about before we talk about our lessons? I think we already did. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I guess I'll reiterate mine then real quick. Like, that's kind of what I took away from it was like, if you're writing memoir and you're trying to recall something, like the act of recalling it is is part of your story. Why you're remembering it, what you do remember, and what you likely have embellished over time. That's all. That's all part of it. It's all... It's like if your therapist is interested, the reader probably needs to know that part. What did you guys take away? My main was uh, the question of why is the summary, why is that background detail so compelling? And I think um, making those details into their own little micro stories or telling other stories or hinting at stories. I mean, we're, we're, we're writing stories. Uh, it feels like it should be stories all the way down. That's what makes us interested in the first place. So I think that's a good lesson to remember when I have to, in my own writing, introduce something that's background material is how do I make that compelling? I make it a story. I make it. And then the way she made it feed upon this, the larger story and bring, make, make it makes the larger story bigger. With those details, it's quite a feat, and that's something to, to steal or mimic. Yeah, you make it sound kind of easy, like, oh, well, just make the details story. Yeah. But, but <laughs> I think it goes back to what you always say, which is, like, picking the right details, Yeah, too. why are we talking about these details? Yeah, right. they're concrete, they're specific, they're... They're real. They're but significant. Why these? significant. Yeah, they're significant. Yes. Yeah, I'd like to write um, not as self. This person doesn't seem to write very self consciously, but on the other hand, it's still just artistically cool to me. The sentences uh, they're unusual. Uh, her word choice is it's kind of quirky sometimes, and I love that. So, and that seems like a tough mix to be arty and kind of weird, but also to kind of feel removed from it too because they're often with kind of more artistic or avant-garde stuff which some of her sentences seem that way to me they seem um you got to be trying to do that a lot of that's most of the time it doesn't come naturally to some people um so i'd love to apply that to my stuff cool well this was another good episode we're killing it yeah all right thanks guys